Yeah, should have said, 50 yeah, degrees. Yeah. At this time, I'll call the meeting of the Marshall City Council to order with the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> I'd like to welcome everyone here this evening. We do have an agenda before us. Are there any changes to that agenda? If not, we'll operate under that agenda. The first item then would be consider the approval of the minutes from the last regular meeting that was held on July 12, 2022. The council does have the minutes of that meeting. Are there any corrections? Move to approve. Second. Motion by Steve, seconded by John to approve the minutes as they have been presented. We'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. And the motion passes. Agenda item number two is a public hearing on the annexation of North 7th Street property that's owned by Western Minnesota Municipal Power Agency. It's 80.52 acres. Um, Jason or Dennis? Or who's going to conduct this public hearing? I can do that. Too. I'll call on uh, City Attorney Dennis uh, Simpson to conduct this public hearing. Thank you, Mayor. Your packet contains the petition for annexation of the 80.52 acres. You recognize that it's off the off North 7th Street as you head out towards the grass tree dump, which has had a lot of traffic this summer. The 80 and a half acres. It has been identified as some property that could be orderly annexed into the city of Marshall pursuant to a 1982 agreement between the city and Fairview Township. I've included in your packet a copy of all of the land that has been contained within that orderly annexation agreement. The city has received the petition to have that property annexed. The law requires that both Fairview Township and the city of Marshall hold a public hearing regarding the proposed annexation. This is the public hearing held by, to be held by the city of Marshall. I do not know of a date and time yet. If one has been set for Fairview Township, they have been um, advised of their requirement to hold that public hearing. Property would go from the jurisdiction of the township to the city for taxation purposes. I don't believe there has been any request for additional utility services out there yet to this point. The property will be used as a solar farm. Um, I do not know the proposed construction time, but I do believe they, they plan to proceed to start next year, 2023. Um, so I guess we're open for questions. It's if you okay, We'll open up for input as part of the public hearing, either from the council members that are present or from members of the audience. Is there any input as part of the public hearing? One question, Jason, and you may not may have to do some research on this, but are, are there any, any assessments for for North 7th Street that have been um, delayed until such time that it comes into the city? No, I, I do not believe we did any deferred assessments on okay. that project. I think we paid them all. Any other input as part of the public hearing? Make a motion to close the public hearing. Second. Motion by John, seconded by Jim to close the public hearing. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. <clears throat> And the motion passes. Dennis, is there any other action that is necessary here? On this item? Other than to approve the approve annexation. The annexation. Okay. Yep. Is there a motion to that effect? I'll make the motion to approve the annexation. I'll second. Motion by Jim, seconded by John. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. We'll close the voting. And the motion passes. Thank you. Our, our second public hearing is a public hearing regarding the Surface Water Management Ordinance Amendment, which is Chapter 30, Article 2, Section 30 to 43, and Section 30 to 45 of the City Code of Ordinances. Once again, we'll have a public hearing, receive public input, 
And then following the public hearing, we'll consider the adoption of the ordinance. With that, I'll call on Jason Anderson to conduct this public hearing. Jason is City Engineer, Director of Public Works. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the changes for this are, are pretty wholesale. Uh, section 30-43 is being stricken and replaced with a reference to the MPCA's uh, construction stormwater general permit. And section 30-45 uh, has large sections of it uh, that are gonna be struck out and replaced with a reference to our MS4 permit. Uh, city staff just believes that it it's a bit redundant to have our own standards in addition to these state permits when our intention is to, to meet the state requirement. So this was a simpler way to go about it. Our LNO committee did hear this on June 28th and recommended to bring it forward. Okay, thank you. As part of the public hearing, uh, is there any input either from the council or members of the audience? Craig. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just for clarity now, Jason, as when we adopt, we adopt the, to the Minnesota stormwater rules by reference, correct? Correct. And so if, if the state of Minnesota updates the rules, our rules automatically change and we don't have any need to do notice or anything else? That is correct. Okay. Any other input as part of the public hearing? John. Just uh, this was, as mentioned, brought to Legislative and Ordinance Committee and uh, uh, was our recommendation to bring it to Council. Any other input as part of the public hearing? I move we close the public hearing. Second. Motion by Craig, seconded by Jim to close the public hearing discussion. If not, we'll move to a vote. We'll close the voting. And the motion passes. We'll now consider the, uh, the ordinance that was the subject of the public hearing. Any questions about the ordinance? I move adoption. Second. Second. Motion by Craig, seconded by Steve to adopt the ordinance as presented. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. Close the voting. And the motion passes. <clears throat> the next uh, item would be the consent agenda. We'll bring the items up on the screen that are on the consent agenda this evening. And those items include a floodplain management ordinance amendment um, the, of the city code of ordinance. The action would be the introduction of the ordinance and calling for a public hearing. Uh, Channel Parkway pavement replacement project. Consider the authorization to advertise for bids. Consider the approval of the transient merchant license for uh, country fresh farms. Consider approval of a temporary on sale intoxicating liquor license for the Convention and Visitors Bureau. Consider approval of the application to conduct off site gambling for American Legion. Consider the amended resolution approving the final plat of CDI addition. And consider the approval of the bills and the project payments. Is there any item on the consent agenda any member of the council wants removed for purposes of separate discussion? Number five, please. Any other item? If not, uh, is there a motion for the remaining? To approve. And second. Motion by Steve, seconded by John to approve the remaining items on the consent agenda with the exclusion of agenda item number five. Discussion on that motion? If not, we'll move to a vote. <coughs> and we'll close the voting. And the motion passes. Agenda item number five then is the uh, Channel Parkway pavement replacement project. Russ. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Jason, just it says on the bottom we're going to use funding for state aid advances. Uh, are we still out five years on our advances? And are we pretty well maxed out? Yes. Uh, in, sh in short, yes. We're probably longer than that. We've got a plan that we've been working through with District 8, State 8 Office. Uh, Jesse and I have put together kind of a 10-year plan with them to work our way out of advanced status. And this project is included on the list, so it's all part of the, the plan for us to keep doing work that we need to do while also working our way out of advanced status. So we can go beyond five years is what, you, what, what I'm hearing? 
We are advanced. We, so um, I guess the, the spreadsheet that we've created in coordination with District 8 shows our running balance as we go along. We're continually coming out of the advanced status because we get annual allocations, but as we continue to add projects, it keeps kicking it out further. So, Because we're asking here for over $2 million, I mean, right? It'll be, uh, yeah, whatever the... Th Local 3. share 3.3 3 minus 1.25, yeah. 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 Local share 2.1 million. It'll probably be less than that because the engineering won't add up to as much as we show. Uh, we'll have to uh, go by actual expenses incurred so we produce reports. It'll probably be less than that on this particular project because it's such a short duration project. Thank you. Yep. With that, I entertain a motion for agenda item number five. So move. Motion by Craig. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second. Seconded by John. Discussion? I have a quick question. It's follow up on Russ's question. Is there a disadvantage of being spread out that far? I mean, is there something that could come back and, per se, bite us later on because we are out that far? I think the disadvantage is, is that we're not um, really flexible to take on additional projects within the state aid realm. Um, that's, that's where we struggle. We, we can think of other projects and other things that we should start to talk about with the council, but we're hampered by the fact that we're in an advanced status. So that's why it's important to us to continue to work our way out. There's no real negative beyond that that I'm aware of. Well, and from, and Jason, you can address this from MnDOT standpoint, this is a way of advancing funds that they have for this purpose to communities that have development going on. Every community probably has, that is over 5,000, has an allocation. Many of those communities don't have this type of development, like a regional community like Marshall would. So. Yeah. And then my last question is, and I drive this path quite regularly, is this a pressing project? I don't, and this is my opinion, as you brought it up. I don't see this road as bad off as it says it is, and I pull a trailer on this road all the time. It's a, it's a sure. lot smoother than going down 59. Sure, no, um, point taken. Uh, so city staff applied for the LRIP grant. Uh, the LRIP grant only applies to specific routes. Uh, one of the only routes, if not the only route that we could think of to apply for this grant funding was Channel Parkway. Uh, the review committee agreed it was a good, a good choice and gave us $1.25 million to put towards it. Um, we probably could defer the surface replacement another couple, let's say two or three years. You would start to see the road continue to fall apart. And then we would have to uh, pony up, so to speak. And if you just mill and overlay it at that time, you're probably getting close to that million dollar cost and you're having a 15 year lifespan as opposed to, to putting the money in and getting hopefully 30 plus and no maintenance, no mill and overlay, no seal coat. So. Um, the road's got a really good section. The curb and gutter is really good. The drainage is good. It's just a matter of stripping the pavement surface, putting the concrete down, and, and hopefully getting a long life. So the, the, the follow this up is we could lose that one point one point two five million if we do not do the project. Now. Correct, and it won't look very good to the state since they gave us the the grant if we don't execute it. So, okay. <clears throat> any other yeah. questions? One other Jason? pitch I'd like to put in, and I don't want to get the cart too far in front of the horse, but if we continue to talk about diverting some of our heavy load traffic from through downtown, this is one of the major threadways that we would use. So I think it's smart to prep it up if we're serious about continuing that conversation. Any other questions? If not, what are the wishes of the council? I move approval. Second. Most by Craig, seconded by Jim, to approve the authorization to advertise for bids for the Channel Parkway Pavement Replacement Project. Discussion on that motion. I think, Mayor, we had a motion prior to Craig and I. I think you did, too. But yeah, I we had a motion prior to... Yeah, my apologies. Then, yeah, you had yeah. discussion, so... My apologies. <laughs> So I'm sorry for making another motion. <laughs> You're retracted. I'd retract it. I'd retract it. Mine too, because we have a motion. Okay. Well, we'll get through this. Any other um, discussion on the motion that is on the table? If not, we'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. And the motion passes. We'll move then to agenda item number 11. This is a presentation of the Shades of the Past uh, Car Club donation to 
Terrace, 1872. Sharon, you want to start with this? Uh, sure. Uh, we uh, obviously noted as today, too, we have started some work on Terrace 1872, and this is being done by our own park staff, led by Preston Stensrud. We have had community requests to donate to the plaza, and uh, Preston has had some pieces, furniture patio pieces that um, has a cost to them and has offered that as a potential uh, sponsorship item. So Shades of the Past has uh, provided a donation for a bench and I believe they wanted to come forward and formally present it to Preston Stensrud, our park superintendent. Preston, if you want to come forward as well as uh, the representatives from Shades of the Past. On behalf of the Shades of the Past, um, I would like to thank you for allowing us to be here tonight to do this presentation. Um, I'm Tom Melbrook, the treasurer of the club, and I brought along with me upper management, Ken DeFries. <laughs> <laughs> Ken DeFries is our president, and Wayne Mack is the vice president. Um, we would like to take this opportunity to thank you for the uh, different events that you have helped us with over the years, like the roll-in that's been going on the past couple years, we have our event the first weekend in June, the uh, cruise on Friday night, and then the show on Saturday. Uh, another one is the Sounds of Summer. You know, you are all help us out with being a part of those things for the city of Marshall. Um, over the past few years, uh, the club has received uh, some monetary donations from different people for members of the club who have passed. And the club has decided that this is a perfect opportunity for us to pool that money together and the club make a donation to the city of Marshall for a bench in this uh, uh, patio area by City Hall and Main State. So at this time, Ken DeFries will make the presentation of the check. Thank you so much. I'll uh, just say quickly uh, thank you to the Shades of the Past, uh, not only for uh, this donation towards this project, but they've also helped with um, some playground pieces in the past, too. Um, so all these partnerships uh, help make Marshall a better place. So thank you, guys. <clears throat> thank you, Preston. Thank you. On behalf of the, the city, uh, Wayne and Tom and Kenny, we would say thank you not only for this donation, but also for being part of this community in this region that what you do really adds to the quality of life. So thank you. Thank you. Any, any other comments? Okay. Very good. We'll move then to agenda item number 12. This would be considered the variance adjustment permit at 905 West Main Street. I'll call on Ilya Gutmann. This item was considered by the Planning Commission at their last meeting and they recommended approval. Go ahead, Elia. Thank you, Mayor Council. This is a request by the owners to build a house at 905 West Main. Uh, there is an existing foundation there, which is left after the fire, I think about two years ago, something like that. The problem is that uh, this is a zoned B3 general business district, and the houses, single family houses, are not permitted to use there. However, the ordinance allows rebuilding uh, the existing structure within 180 days after the fire or any other natural disaster. So the variance really, I should emphasize, is not for building in the house in the uh, general business district. It's for extending the 180 days to uh, two years uh, for permitted, uh, uh, re 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 permitting rebuilding of the uh, destroyed structure. Uh, statutes and ordinance require uh, practical difficulties for uh, granting the variance and the memo outlines it uh, in staff's mind it meets the requirements so recommendation is to approve the variance okay. <clears throat> thank you the, the applicants are here uh, this evening also are there any questions the um, planning commission in their discussion they recognize that the neither the the buyer who is going to be constructing this house nor the seller the 180 days um, 
was really beyond anyone's control there. There was other issues going on there and it just took a while to get through all that, so. Are there any other input? I would just like to applaud the, the, the new property owners because that been an eyesore for two years, so thank you for building. With that, I'd entertain a motion. Approval. I'll second. second. Motion by Craig, seconded by Russ to approve the variance as recommended. Discussion on that motion? If not, we'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. And the motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Agenda item number 13, uh, consider the approval of the labor agreements between the city of Marshall and AFSCME council number 65. Sharon? Uh, yes, we uh, have Sheila Dubbs, human resources director to prevent, or to present, excuse me, the summary of changes. We also have uh, via Zoom, if Stephen or Alex could uh, pull her up, we, we do have our labor attorney who assisted in particular with this union contract was we did uh, end up in mediation, Susan Hansen. And uh, Hello. we are uh, have her available in case there's some questions, although we are in open session and some details of the negotiation are uh, obviously confidential through the through the process, but um, she can enlighten, enlighten the council and the public if there's some specific quest legal questions regarding the contract. Otherwise, Mr. Mayor, we can turn it over to Sheila, if you wish, to cover some of the contract amendments. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Sheila? Thank you, Mayor. Um, for your consideration this evening is a proposed labor agreement with the AFSCME Union. The current contract did expire on December 31st of 2021. Uh, after completion of our class and comp study, staff began negotiations, as Sharon mentioned, with AFSCME in March. And though we were unable to reach an agreement in negotiations, we were successful in reaching tentative agreement with AFSCME in mediation. That occurred on July 6th. The majority of the contract amendments that are proposed in this agreement are the same that have been approved for the two LELS unions previously. Uh, I'll briefly review the amendments and then I'll open it up for any questions that you have. Um, in the labor agreement, we'll start with that. The cover page just updates for the dates of the contract. The table of contents has been updated um, and the contract dates uh, in Article 1 in the purpose of agreement have been updated. In the definition section, the addition of business days has been added. Um, and then if we move to Article 6, our grievance procedure, this is the same uh, language that we added to both of the LELS contracts as well. Um, change calendar days to business days, which provides additional time to review a grievance by staff as well as the union um, and conduct interviews and meetings to determine the facts of the issue and possible resolution. Um, the next one is insurance, and I apologize in your summary, I had Article 16 there, it is actually Article 14. Um, Updated dates of the contract for insurances. Um, Article 10 is discipline, um, and that was amended so that copies of written reprimands will be given to the employee and not the union. If discipline would escalate to the suspension, demotion, or discharge levels, then the business agent would be provided notice. Uh, under Article 11, the overtime and compensatory time, um, there will be an annual payout proposed of compensatory time over 45 hours on the last pay period of the year. Uh, article 12 is a new article, shift differential. Um, this would be uh, pertaining to three of the classifications in the union. Um, the maintenance technicians that work at our Red Baron Arena and Expo would be paid an additional 50 cents per hour for any hours worked between 5 p.m. and 12 a.m. <coughs> Um, articles 13 through 19 had updated article numbers. And then uh, the standby is the next clause. Um, and the proposal is to increase standby for our wastewater operators, our plant operators, and our maintenance operators um, who are on call uh, to $24 per day. 
The next one is Article 14, our insurances. Um, that updates the dates of the contract and it establishes union representation on an insurance committee. That is an advisory committee uh, to administration. And then on Article 20, the holidays, um, this language clarifies which dates our employees at wastewater who work shift schedules receive the holiday pay on. We had some confusion with that. This uh, simply clarifies it. We did not have a grievance on this, but um, this helps us clarify for wastewater employees um, who work shift schedules. Uh, the next article, 24, is the clothing. The allowance uh, is proposed to increase $25 from $350 to $375, and the footwear allowance is proposed to increase from $175 to $200. Um, the footwear allowance language uh, was previously in our personnel policy in Appendix A, but uh, we're, we're proposing to move it into the contract so that all of the terms of the agreement for AFSME are in one place, not in two places. Um, Article 29 updates the date of the contract for the duration clause. And Appendix A, uh, the language regarding implementation of our new pay structure and wage schedules for the three years of the agreement um, is proposed. Uh, the union agreed to an implementation plan consistent with what the council has previously approved for both the non-union and both LELS unions. The wage schedules do reflect the following general wage increases it would be 2% for 2022, 3% 2023, and 3% for 2024. Um, the other document that you have is the Memorandum of Understanding. Um, again, this was approved for the non-union and both LELS unions and has historically been approved um, to update the effective dates of the proposed wage schedules uh, for the first pay period that includes January 1st for ease of payroll administration. And with that, um, I will open it up for any questions. Okay, thank you, Sheila. Questions? Sheila, I have a question on, on uh, Article 12, and, and I've since talked to the city administrator and also a fellow council member. I personally have a problem with paying 50 cents an hour more at the Red Baron Arena for the hours work between 5 and midnight because that's the majority of the time that the hockey games are played. Uh, they just shouldn't they be scheduled during the, those shift and why should they be paid additional because they're scheduled? I mean, I understand in talking with Sharon and, and council member that this is probably quite common, but I personally have a problem with paying 50 cents an hour more when most of the hockey games are at night. I mean, I, I, if they get called out because somebody's sick or on vacation or something happens, I don't have a problem with that. But if I'm scheduled to work starting at four o'clock in the afternoon until 10 o'clock at night, why do, and I'm, I'm just saying, hypothetical, why do I get paid 50 cents an hour or more? So I'll give a couple of reasons for that. One is that these three employees do not have typical Monday through Friday schedules like the other Parks and Public Works employees do. So this was a, a good way of showing them that we appreciate them working a very flexible schedule. They do not work Monday through Friday shifts. They can. It also flexes into weekends, it's early mornings, it's late evenings, it's afternoon, it's all over the place. There is not a standard shift for them to work. So this is a, a goodwill way of showing them that we appreciate their flexibility. Um, and this is also, new, is this correct? This is a, this is a new clause, okay. yes. Um, I will say that also um, we currently provide our police officers with a shift differential the same shift differential of 50 cents, and that's between 5 p.m. and 7 a.m., um, which is which is consistent, has been consistent in our contracts for quite some time. Um, they, too, have um, non-Monday through Friday shifts, of course. They're 24-7. But that's been there for quite a while. It has. Okay. Yep. Um, the city of Wilmer, I went back and looked at that contract. They have a civic center, and um, they do pay their employees from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m., that additional 50 cents. Um, I'm, that is also an ASME contract, and I'm thinking that that's where this business agent may have um, come up with the proposal. Um, I'm not sure if that's his particular unit or not, but they are a civic center and are providing this benefit as well. Just curious, do you think this would cause a morale problem with other city employees that these people get paid 50 cents an hour more? I honestly don't think so. Okay. I don't think other city employees 
would uh, want the schedules that these three employees work. Thank you. Sure. I uh, just want to add a couple items for LALS. It is also scheduled differential. It's not differential just for unscheduled hours. And I typically, for the shift differential language I've seen, it is not contingent on whether it's scheduled or unscheduled. Right. It's based on the time frame of when that work schedule is occurring. Part of this is due, maybe largely due, to the increased usage of Red Baron and the increased pressure of the scheduling uh, on those particular times that Red Baron is getting utilized more often. And uh, it was an early concern or issue brought up by the union. And uh, we felt that this provision brought us to agree an agreement at a very relatively low economic impact to the city. Yeah, my input on this is I think that a 50 cent pay differential is very reasonable. And my input is, is I like to compare us to the private sector. And this isn't that uncommon in the private sector. There's many businesses, I know I visit Russ beforehand. I have a daughter who gets a shift differential. Then I can think of when my son worked at Menard, she had a shift differential here in Marshall. So this, this is common here in town too. So I like to try to keep us on a level playing field with the private sector and, and this does match in. Any other questions for Sheila or Sharon? If not, uh, I would entertain a motion. I move approval of the uh, labor agreement. Second. Motion by Craig, seconded by Jim. Discussion on that motion? If not, we'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. And the motion passes. We'll move then to the next agenda item, which would be agenda item number 14. This is the annual report of Tallgrass Liquor. EJ, do you want to start with this or do we go straight to Eric Luther? <laughs> EJ is the Director of Administrative Services. The uh, Tallgrass Liquor falls under his area, but the manager and the one who is really responsible is Eric Luther. And Eric is uh, um, our well-respected manager and he'll uh, do the annual report. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Honorable Mayor and City Council. I did bring um, kind of some merch here from our, uh, what we were selling here at the liquor store, 150th anniversary, uh, cheers to 150 years. So I do have some other um, samples back there. I'll kind of leave it back there at the table so you guys can take a look at it. But um, kind of celebrating things here as uh, some of the other organizations in town. So um, be sure to take a look at that before you leave tonight. So I break that. <laughs> yeah. You'd have to buy it. Yeah. Yeah, buy it. Yeah. So um, uh, I'm going to uh, go ahead and go over the, the annual report for 2021. Um, we're on page three there. Um, obviously, liquor operations have been here since 1934. Uh, we've been in East College Drive location and then uh, just recently moved over to um, Boyer Drive uh, in November of 2016. Um, Profits from the liquor store go to uh, sources that are needed in the city of Marshall and the community. Um, helps um, reduce property tax levy and provides special funds for those projects. So, um, organizational structure you can kind of see. Um, got a good, good, great core of uh, full time and part time people to meet the business needs of our customers. You can see the mission statement there, nothing's changed with that. Uh, um, again, we make most of our business decisions or all of our business decisions um, based on the mission statement. And then we also have store priorities, which kind of guide our part-time people and our uh, other employees that work um, in the store and that. So, so page four, 2021, overall sales of the liquor store operations were 6725679 net, net profit of 944.305. It's a decrease of total sales by 100, about 135,000 and a net profit decrease of a little less than 100,000 when compared to 2020. And we'll address that a little bit later in kind of our sales and some of that. Um, but you can kind of see the five-year sales history, the next graph, 
and the net profit, profit history um, too that goes back five years. So um, we've had some uh, a great back-to-back -back year of strong sales and profitability this is kind of the bottom line from 2020 and 2021. Um, hopefully we'll keep that going um, as we go into the future. Um, the uh, gross profit categories there, you can kind of see liquor, wine, beer, spirits, and miscellaneous. This has stayed about the same for the last several years and previous years. Um, and you can kind of see gross profit by wine, beer, spirits, and miscellaneous too. Um, not a lot of change there. Beer continues to be the, the least profitable. Um, we do have our craft beer that kind of makes up a little bit of that difference um, there. Uh, wine is down a little bit this year. Um, spirits has grown a little bit. So in general, we've, I think we've uh, tried to attain a strong gross profit um, along with uh, sales um, and that. So page six, you can kind of see the five-year monthly sales comparison. So if you see that yellow bar <clears throat> back in 2020 in March, April, May, and in a little bit in June, you can kind of see that spike. You know, everyone, um, hopefully, um, maybe that memory has all gone, but uh, this kind of um, tells a little bit of a story about um, where our sales were at that time. Uh, large increases in that 20 plus range for those, well, actually March was only about two weeks, you know, because COVID and lockdowns and stuff like that came middle of March. So you can kind of see that spike really um, affected our sales, probably affected a little bit of our profits. People were indulging, people were um, pantry stocking and everything like that. Um, but you see those four months there have um, really outpaced what what has 2021, our current year that we're reviewing. But you can kind of see that latter part of the year, the six months, um, you can kind of see things kind of got back to normal. We kept up with 2020 and kind of those spikes and some of that. So, and, uh, and, and, and we'll talk a little bit about the percentages here on the next page. But um, so I think, you know, that's a little bit of the story that we want to kind of make sure that everybody realizes too. We're comparing against a kind of a, a, a year that, you know, one of those years that never comes around in a hundred years. So um, anyway, so um, to give you that. Um, so trends wise, uh, as we, we're seeing um, currently, ready to drink cocktails have grown in popularity and have surpassed hard seltzers. Remember, we talked about hard seltzers the last time here, and, um, but ready to drink cocktails, brands like Jameson, Absolute, Malibu, Ciroc, and Two Chicks, and Crown Royal have all entered, this, uh, entered the market with uh, several choices of ready to drinks, which are high quality drinks, bartender drinks, um, and so that you can kind of see is the trend what's happening now. Events, uh, we've resumed in-store sampling um, with, um, at the store there, larger events like the fall wa wine walkabout or the holiday wine and spirits walkabout were held at the store. We, we kind of moved those before out into a um, on-sale premise and had a little bigger space. We've elected to, to kind of make those in-house, save some money there and stuff. So helps customers make decisions before their purchase. Um, and our customers have a great interest in that um, sampling before they buy. And just a quick note about, uh, we held the Craft Beer Festival that was started by Tall Grass Liquor this past year. Um, was a great success with probably close to 400 people um, attending um, in that. So great community involvement there. Um, as you can see, we've done some community support, um, continue to do that with outreach to Tracy Pet Rescue, United Way Imagination Library, SMSU Foundation, and some of the events that they host and some of the events there, post-prom donations there. So uh, continue to be involved in the community. So page seven, um, continued to train our staff with uh, alcohol off-sale training and carting. Um, very important part of our mission to control the sale of alcohol. We need to have everybody on the same page. We can't let um, uh, one thing kind of slip by. It's gotta be uh, all the time. 
Um, also been involved with the attendance at the Minnesota Municipal Beverage Association regional meetings and then an annual meeting. Um, and that's a great um, time to network with area managers um, and learn about some of the things that are happening in our industry. Um, so number seven, semi-annual review, you can kind of see the past three years. Um, 2020, you know, we had a, a large gain in sales at that first half of the year. Um, customer counts, average tickets, the whole deal there. 2021, you can kind of see that decrease because of that spike, uh, customer count um, and sales. And as you see in 2022, um, we've regained a little bit of that that we've lost in that first, uh, or actually last year. Um, and so we're trending pretty close to what 2020 during that COVID um, lockdown area and that season there. Um, so sales are going the right direction, 2.6 up, uh, customer counts up, average tickets up. And then again, you can kind of see the monthly sales comparisons there, um, like we talked about a little bit earlier. Um, so proposed budget, um, as we look at um, how we're gonna approach 2023, we've been kind of conservative, um, and with a baseline of 2022, we're, as we said, we're trending slightly ahead of 2021 sales. Um, and I think customers are seeing the, um, the value that we offer here at Tallgrass. Yeah, versus maybe some of the other liquor stores or off sale or on sale, excuse me, um, uh, uh, places to, to buy and purchase ready to drink um, beverages. So um, as we've talked about, gross profit is a big part of our business. We've, you know, we've got sales, we need to continue to hit um, a great gross profit margin or be in that range. Um, and again, I'll, I'll maybe allude to that here a little bit, but, uh, uh, the gross profit margins and this operating margins of operating a business are getting compressed with increased in labor and freight and product costs. Um, and those are gonna be continual challenges for us as we uh, finish this year and as we get into 2023. Um, we have done some um, investments that have paid off with the gross profits and so on. Uh, we've installed a 50 ml merchandiser, a self so cooler for displaying single cans for purchase, and a pick six mix and match area, which are all designed to help with add-on purchases which have higher gross profit dollars associated with them. Um, this uh, past year, we've um, in installation of beer cooler wrap that's above our um, beer cooler. We raised lettering to identify the beer cooler categories. And then we also rolled out eShop, which is an online ordering system that you can order ahead and pick up curbside or in store for customer's convenience. Um, so far in 2022, we've resealed and recolored the floor, um, which is kind of necessary to keep their building looking good. Um, we purchased a second single serve refrigerated merchandiser to expand the single can and chilled wine offerings. And we're gonna to plan to put a mop sink in the back warehouse area to help with cleanup and um, different things back there. So something that we'd like to kind of improve for next year, we got a short list because we're gonna be wor worried about profits, no. Um, but um, wanna replace, replace the floor in the employee break room, which um, is in bad shape. And then also the front entryway, so you get a, a great welcoming um, area for customers as they enter the building. Um, so just a few closing comments here. Um, the bond payoff, everybody is, I think is worried about that. It's very close. Um, hopefully by the end of the year, we a good year. I believe, I believe this should be a, a primary focus, you know, considering the challenges of, of operating businesses and increased costs um, and things like that, we really need to kind of make me focus on our, uh, our building and all those things that we have to do to, to, to be profitable. Uh, once that's paid off, plans can be made for future liquor profit investments back in the community. Um, so the other thing I kind of was thinking about, the number of customers visiting Tallgrass is approaching 200,000 a year, making it probably the largest point of contact for our community members needing city services. Um, not to mention it's a destination experience for many area residents visiting Marshall. So I think that's a great thing. Um, obviously, people see that in different lights, but I think it's a great, um, great thing to have. 
great asset. This fall, there will be about 40 legislative seats turning over with retirements. With this, there will be new, many, <clears throat> new people with new viewpoints and opinions that will need education about municipal liquor, specifically wine, beer, everywhere. I would ask whenever you get the opportunity to talk to these candidates or maybe the current legislators with about Minnesota liquor and how it contributes valuable economic monies back into the local communities, you would advocate for no change in the current Minnesota liquor laws. A change would cause huge negative impact to the city. So that's it. Any questions? Thank you, Eric. I think um, just a couple of comments before we move to questions. I think one of the things that we also want to recognize and we just see nearing the completion of the Independence Park trails, which were um, heavily supported by the, um, the profitability that you had in 2020 during that COVID year. So that was, um, that, that was a, a great contribution to the community. And when you mentioned the, the bond, and EJ, you can weigh in on this, uh, this 2022 is the earliest possible call date for the bond late this year. So the bond is actually scheduled to go out, I believe, another 10 years. If, if, am I correct on that? I believe it goes through 2029. So, so the earliest possible call date is, is this year, and you're right on target to uh, uh, retire that bond at the earliest possible date based on kind of good management, good profitability, and good returns that we have, and contributions back to the community. And then finally, we'd also mention that the renovation of this building, the bond is uh, highly supported by uh, the revenue from tall grass. Well, I would just make the comment coming from the building committee that the liquor store and the bond retires, it is gonna pay for city hall then. So the city hall had a net zero levy impact to remodel this beautiful building we have here due to, and I'm part of those that go through our liquor store. I'm one of those 200,000 that venture in there once in a while. Very good. We, we too get counted more than once. And uh, <laughs> um, one thing I wanna say, and this goes all the way down through Texas because we get a number of visitors that we know personally that come up and there isn't a person that comes into town that has that experience that doesn't leave hugely impressed and very complimentary. And it's not just the, the business, it's the management. And the only thing they say is we should have made it bigger. <laughs> I hear it a lot, we should have made it bigger. Any other input? The floors look nice. I did notice the floors are done too. They do look nice. Well, again, thank you, Eric. Yep. Thank you guys. Thank you for your work. Thanks, Eric. Oh. We'll move then to um, agenda item. Where are we at? Uh, agenda item number 15, consider the approval of the fire department's amended organizational structure and wage schedule. I believe the uh, fire chief is uh, Quentin Brunsfold might be available. Otherwise, uh, Director of Public Safety, Jim Marshall is here, here present. And Quentin Brunsfold might be available by Zoom. Okay. There he is, yeah. so. We just watched all the fire trucks drive by. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yes, unfortunately, I'm unable to be in attendance. I got bit by the snake here last week for the first time, so I'm fulfilling my uh, quarantining here at home. So I appreciate uh, being able to speak uh, here to the council in front of you in the in the uh, in your agenda items. Here you'll notice uh, the background information for it. Uh, as you can see, this proposal requests approval to amend the job titles and the job descriptions for three of the command positions of the fire department transitioning. Uh, the three existing assistant chief positions into one assistant chief of training, one assistant chief of operations, and including a new position, which is called, which is the deputy fire chief. Uh, the proposed organizational structure and job descriptions are included in your background materials as well. No change is being requested to the staffing levels. Rather, this change provides clarification of duties uh, within the command structure of the fire department. Um, the second part of this as well also uh, does um, include the additional amendment to the wage schedule being proposed. And we did talk about this a couple of years ago uh, with the addition of the technical rescue team. And uh, with that trained firefighters uh, can, uh, comes the request to increase the pay for those individuals up to the, uh, the same that corresponds with our hazardous materials and uh, technicians and firefighter pay scale. So same type of uh, request there. Uh, I, 
obviously, as you as you can see, everything's in your uh, background information there. And if I if I'm here for any more uh, questions, if there are any. Okay. Uh, thank you, Quentin. The um, I believe you also uh, uh, mentioned in your material that because of a retirement, because of a resignation, this is a really a great time to clarify the organizational structure. Yes, correct. As you all know, Ray Henriksen, 35 years of service, which we're very grateful for, and we all are, uh, did retire here in March, so we're grateful for his service. And then our uh, training chief, uh, uh, Mark Antony, had just recently uh, resigned here in the beginning of July. So we started the process a number of months ago to try to get to this level here, and, and uh, I'm finally glad to be at this position because I could use a little bit of help. Questions for Quentin? <clears throat> Russ? Mayor, thank you. Thank you, Quentin, for this uh, information. Um, as most of the council knows, I have a, I, I've been on the fire department, served 20 years, served under a number of chiefs, uh, Dave Marks, Mark Claith, Ken Versable. Um, and this is the first time I've seen this amount of change coming from the fire department when the chief signs up for the job. And the chief is elected, the chief was always elected by the membership up until Mark Claith, I believe. Uh, the assistant chiefs were elected by the membership. Now we're saying the chief gets to appoint these things. My first question before I, I, I ask anything is that I'm going to ask Dennis for a legal opinion. Are th these in violation of the fire department bylaws? Well, I've not reviewed those bylaws. I, I believe they are because the membership has to approve these changes before the bylaws. And I don't the believe the membership has approved the bylaws. Uh, uh, address the changes to the bylaws. Sheila? The bylaws are actually illegal. Um, according to the League of Minnesota Cities, there's a huge write-up about it. Uh, the membership can no longer elect their uh, their command positions. It's, a, it's been deemed illegal for a number of years. Uh, I, that's why this change kind of started coming forward here about 10 years ago that I remember. Mark Claith was actually uh, elected to that position and then transitioned to an appointed position is how that worked into. Uh, and it hasn't been voted. Uh, nobody's been elected, I believe, in at least 10 years that I recall. The fire chief position, Quentin. How about the assistant chiefs? Oh, same. They've all been appointed. By the chief? Correct. So one person decides who the assistants are instead of the membership? Correct. Don't, don't, With don't the assistance of the these director members of public work, safety. Don't these members work for the community? Mr. Labatt, I don't, I don't uh, write the laws. I'm not in charge of that, but all I know is bylaws are illegal and they cannot be elected by the members. Well, you she, have, you she have she standard you. operating procedures and so you have bylaws. And if I, I may. Yep. Head, Sheila. Our uh, policy manual, our personnel policy manual, prescribes our procedure for hiring, and the paid on call fire department is no different. We go through an application and interview process. Uh, the chief, fire chief Quinton, uh, sits on the panel. There's usually additional members sitting on the panel during the interview process and a recommendation is made by that panel to the chief and then that recommendation forwards to the director of public safety and to Sharon Hansen. The city administrator is the final authority on who is hired for employees for all positions in the city of Marshall. So the process follows the same process for our part-time and full-time employees for paid on call. So the Firefighters, a final approval is by Sharon? It is. Thank you, Sheila. It follows the same hiring process. <laughs> and so the the current bylaws and... There are no are, current bylaws. They're, they're the League of Minnesota Cities... For years? Quinton is, is correct. We were advised by the League of Minnesota Cities that the bylaws were not legal, and so we do not have bylaws anymore. Our entire fire department complies with our personnel policy manual. So are we the only fire department in this area that does it this way or does others do it? Um, I'm assuming that uh, others do it. I don't know about the smaller communities around us like Lind, but I do know that Worthington and Wilmer follow similar practices. We're not allowed to have bylaws anymore. They follow their typical hiring process. I, I just think this is, and again, I just think this is being set up so we get a full-time fire chief and, and and I don't think the city can afford a full-time fire chief or fire department at this point. I think by these, by these titles, I mean, we had assistant oh. chiefs for years, and in my 20 years and 100, 100 years, 
These assistant chiefs knew what their duties were. Now we're designing or coming up with new titles and we're coming up with assist duties, just as Quinton just said, he needs the help. I, I he does, believe he has, that has we're help. coming up with the new titles because we need the administrative work to be done. I think Quinton can attest to the fact that the administrative requirements and the training requirements have escalated probably during the last decade, if not even in the last five years. And that requires administration by our staff. One person can no longer do all of that work. So Quentin is simply asking for help. There are no discussions at this time about making a full-time fire chief position. So, but again, we're, we're changing assistant, title only, assistant chief to a deputy chief. We're, we're changing three assistant chief positions, one to focus on the training, both the records and the administration of training for our personnel, one to focus on the operations, which my understanding is the apparatus to make sure the apparatus is safe and that all of the employees that are functioning with that apparatus know what they're doing and a deputy chief of administration to assist with all of the other administrative work that goes along with this. That includes policies and procedures. It includes hiring. It includes a variety of other. I, I have the job descriptions, but I didn't bring them up to the podium with I me. I just think I we're losing sight of the fact that it's a volunteer fire department. And my last question and my last thing, and I'll let you move on, the difference in pay. If, if I'm a firefighter and I've got 20 years of service, and I'm going to use Preston, he's got multiple years of service, he gets paid X amount of dollars, $18, whatever it is. But if, if I go on as a new firefighter and I serve on the hazmat team, I get $20 an hour. I get $2 an hour more for fire calls, for drills, for everything else. Is that fair? Should yes. that person that's being on the hazmat team or the high-level high rescue, when that situation calls for those people to be on duty, then they get paid more. But for a re we just seen half a dozen trucks go down Main Street here. There's guys out on the trucks tonight that are going to be paid $18 an hour, and there's other guys going to be paid $20. They're doing the same thing. The employees in the hazmat technician positions have received a substantial amount of training that goes beyond what the firefighter has received. Not denying any of that, Sheila. Quentin. And it, it, everybody had the same opportunity. It was all open to everybody to ask her to apply for these positions. I'll say this, there wasn't one person that was denied the ability to be able to go through the additional training to gain the certifications required to provide this additional service to the citizens of the city of Marshall. And they're all very proud to be able to do that. And for that, we should reward our, our staff for wanting to do this stuff. If you didn't want to do it, nobody is requiring you to do it. And I never required a single person to do it. And so that's why I believe in, uh, in my uh, opinion, it's 100% fair for that because everybody had the same opportunity. So when they apply for the fire department, is it in the application that they have to choose whether it's high level rescue or hazmat? No. So who, who, who decides that? You just said you don't, you don't force them. You make them make a decision, is that correct? In this very beginning phase, when we had to start the process and get these teams initially started, we had to start with a team somewhere. I asked for volunteers from the department, and uh, they've all uh, the ones that are on the team proudly volunteered for it, accepted the positions, uh, became trained and certified, and now they have that. In order to fulfill the staffing model and keep it sustained, yes, after the initial training periods are completed, uh, they will be appointed to these additional positions and, and go through the additional training. And Quentin, we have to do it for staffing. And Quentin, we should add, prior to uh, the appointment of that initial um, um, team of people that took on that additional task, uh, you came to the council and asked for authorization to start that program, and, and we granted you that authorization. So. Correct. I do recall, I actually said, give me 18 months. I believe Dr. Meister asked, how long is this going to take? I said, give me 18 months. And then a month later, you said, here, I have a cat team, a bright, shiny one. You're welcome. So it took a little bit longer, but we got both teams <laughs> implemented and we're doing, uh, they're doing great work. Yep. And thank you, Quentin. Other questions for Quentin? I just have one quick question for clarification. So when you hire a deputy fire chief administrator, that final say, Sheila, is between you and Sharon. It's not an appointed position. They go through the application process and you, it comes down to human resource management, which would be you and, and Sharon Hansen. I do not make any final decisions. The decision is 
Quintons after the interview. Panel comes to a recommendation, it's Quintons, and then Jim Marshall gives his okay, and then it goes to Sharon. So it follows up the chain of command. So the recommendation steps. is from the fire chief. Sharon has the final say. So there's several safeguards or steps in that process. Yes. There's not one person appointing it. It is not. Okay. So if you look at the organizational structure chart, previous you had three assistant fire chiefs. If you look at upper management under the fire chief, you have three positions. It's really just noting a delegation of responsibilities. And instead of Quentin having three direct reports, he has one. I mean, he's the fire chief, so he's still, you know, the ultimate say, I guess. But to me, it was just a better definition of what the fire chief wanted to see in terms of responsibilities. You're not really adding leadership, it's just segregated out. And, you know, on some of these positions, and I'll get outside the fire chief department, I mean, the mayor and I and Sheila had a conversation today about an open position. So it is evaluated on a case by case basis. Typically, the recommendation from the interview hiring panel is accepted. I mean, we have to be a little careful about um, who does and who does not get it. It's the best fit once you get into an interview. And I think the discussion about full-time fire chief, which we've never had here at council since I've been here, uh, which then means that there isn't much support beneath council from administration to move that idea forward. And Quentin, I think, can validate that too. So I just want to put that on the record as well. You haven't been approached about full-time fire chief. It has been discussed, but never brought to council. John, you have a guess? Yes, I agree. This is all strictly procedural. This is putting uh, 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 eyes on paper and crossing the T's. It's really outlining exactly what each person's requirements are. Yes, we have three uh, assistant chiefs in the past that all held the same job description, but they didn't, <coughs> and they didn't hold the same duties. So all we did was streamline it, get the duties written down on paper. There's never a question of what uh, each command of position's job duties are. That way we're not stepping on each other's toes, doing uh, the same work essentially. Everybody stays in their lane and we can complete command and control over our 50 staff and uh, two additional uh, special response teams and one, one happens to be a state response team. It takes a lot of coordination and I'm grateful for the people that, uh, that are gonna be able to hopefully uh, fill this position for the city. John, you have a comment? Just a comment that this was brought to a personnel committee and uh, we did uh, have a discussion with uh, Chief Marshall and, uh, um, you know, move it forward into uh, city council recommendation. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And I wanted to, John, thank you. I wanted to bring that up also. <clears throat> and then to say one of the other points that came clear is the Position of deputy chief getting shaken out, in my opinion, gives a clear command for the assistant chiefs and the other personnel in the event that the chief is not present. And it creates a, a better, clearer, and a redundant structure. If you're an emergency operation, obviously you need command redundancy because you can't expect 100% of your command to be available 100% of the time. Are there any other <clears throat> If not, I'm ready for a motion. I move we approve. I'll second. Motion by Craig, seconded by John. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. And the motion does pass. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you. We'll move then to Agenda item number 16, this is West Lyon Street, North 3rd Street, reconstruction. Uh, consider the acceptance of a proposal for consultant services for the design of the street reconstruction. Jason. Thank you, Mayor. Um, so this is a reconstruction on our plan for next year, downtown Lyon Street and 3rd Street. Um, complete reconstruction, utility replacement. We're working right now with um, Bolton and Mink on streetscape review and uh, input with the downtown group as well as council committee. Um, on March 8th, the council did give us the that authorization to work with Bolton and Mank on the intersection evaluation at 3rd and Main as well as the streetscaping elements of the project. Um, at that time, we elected to 
do the design of the re remainder of the project in house with our own staff. Um, since we've um, we've had some staffing, we, we're losing our assistant city engineer, and uh, we're just concerned of our ability to deliver on time with the uh, change in staffing. So we would ask the council to consider authorization to uh, award the design contract to Bolton and Mank as well. Uh, in the amount of $105,338.71. I have since contacted the Boltman Bank staff. They believe they can deliver on the schedule that we would expect. Thank you, Jason. Questions? Jason, does this include the stoplight? <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> this would include everything it takes for us to build the project that you want. Okay. I mean, I guess I... It's 106 days, 846 hours. It's another $105,000 that we're going to spend of city money, possibly assessed, well, probably part of it assessed to the property owners, but a good share of this will probably come back to the city at Ad Valorum. Um, and again, I think we've had numerous, numerous MDA, MDA meetings. My fellow council people have, have been just like I, maybe back and forth, which way we go, which way we don't go. Um, I just see we're going to spend another $105,000. I understand we're losing a, an assistant engineer. I wish Jesse w would change his mind and stay. Me I too. mean, if we twisted his arm and all sat at him, maybe he, maybe we could keep him here for another six months or something. But Jason, just to clarify, though, the, the amount that is part of the project budget for engineering services that would normally support your department and is being redirected to for this purpose. That is correct. So, so it's not an additional correct. amount. Correct. Yes. But it's, and I think one of the surveys and, and Craig or Jim, correct me if I'm wrong, the downtown property owners took a survey and not very many people participated, but 62% said leave it as is with a two-way two -way traffic signal light, the whole works. Now, I think there's been some discussion since that that we want the signal light to stay if we can have push buttons on all four corners, Craig, if I'm correct. And the, the, it's been changed to a one way, and I think most of the downtown can accept that. But I'm just saying we also have to listen to the not only the property owner on 3rd Street, but the property owners on Main Street. As well as the as entire well, community. As well as the entire community, right, right. right. sure. Oh. And I think it's important, Russ, to hit on one perfect point that you made is that that survey was taken asking questions with limited information about the options that we really have in front of us. There's a whole lot I'd like to have, and then there's a whole lot of what I can actually have. And this is kind of one of those pieces when we look at it, we need to be ADA compliant. We all remember what happened a few years ago when the rogue attorney got together with one handicapped individual and tried to have a payday off the city of Marshall and their businesses. We can't have that again, not just because of the legal part of it, but because of actually being an ADA compliant and welcoming community. Our engineering team throughout those meetings and other presentations to council and to the PINT committee have made it grossly clear that the basic bones footprint that we can accept on third street is really gonna be one way. So we can get parking, we can have adequate sidewalks, Part of that, maybe we get a pavilion area, plaza, maybe we don't. But the two-way street piece is gone, okay? That's just, if, if the only way we can keep it the way it is is to do nothing. And doing nothing is, is not acceptable. The light argument, I think, is gonna be one that's gonna live on for years now, no matter which way we go. It's kind of the ghost legend of Marshall is the corner of Third and Main. I really hope we just stay with the stoplight. Okay, I'm just going to put that out there. And I think that's what everybody... I could, I could share an update on that. Sure, like, yeah, that'd yeah. be a great time. So, you know, I'll start by saying I don't want to confuse two things. You know, I, I want to keep this separate from the topic of what we're going to do. So, so the, let's let's do that. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about the, the, the stoplight separately. How about I give an update at that at the end of the meeting? Would that be sure, appropriate? Sure, perfect. Uh, that has absolutely nothing to do with it. Sure, right. and I just want to emphasize <clears throat> this is entirely me just explaining to the council. I don't know if our department can deliver tomorrow what we're trying to do. Exactly. Right. right. And on this, I think we got to remember that 105000 also includes West Lyon Street. 
So it's not just a one block at Third Street. I believe exactly. it's four blocks on West Line. You're doing two, correct? Four or five? Yeah, I think it's three on Line and two on Third. Five right. blocks. Yeah. Five so blocks. It's just not that one section. Right. So when people are like, well, you spent that much on Third Street. No, we spent that much on a, a downtown corridor on the north end of Main Street. Right. An off, or whatever an off down. Lane. Yeah, yeah, an off down corridor. But keep in mind, this is in addition to the 68000 we already spent. Yeah. Well, and without that $68,000, we'd have a lot less information to make good decisions on than we had when we started. So I don't think it's a cost. I think it was a, a very well done investment because I think if you ask all the people that sat in on those M downtown, Marshall Downtown Business Association meetings, even if they're not 100% happy with the outcome, I think they really appreciate the process. And what gave that process credibility is what our engineering department and the consultants put into it, giving the council information to hopefully make an intelligent decision to move the next 40 or 50 years in that corridor. So honestly, with that, Mr. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to accept the proposal. Motion by Craig. Is there a second to that motion? I will second. Seconded by John. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. And the motion passes. Agenda item number 17, Independence Park, uh, Four Bay Expansion Project. We have a change order to consider. This is a final change order that results in a reduction of what the total project costs would be. Steve, you're interested in that. Um, as well as the acknowledgement of the final pay request. I'd entertain a motion. I'll make the motion to approve a reduction. <laughs> I'd love to second that. Motion <laughs> by Steve, seconded by Craig. Discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. And the motion passes. And the motion does pass. Right. Agenda item number 18, a similar change uh, order request, this time is with a similar result. Um, James Avenue reconstruction project, consider change order number two, the final, as well as the acknowledgement of the final pay request. Are there questions about this change order? I'll make a motion to approve this one. I'll second that. Motion by Jim, seconded by Steve. Discussion? Jason, just uh, is this golf course satisfied with what what happened out there during? Yeah, the I think so. Okay. I think early in the year we had some back and forth with the superintendent regarding a few things, but I, I think ultimately everyone's satisfied okay. with the project. That's great. All right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Board okay with the chair? Yeah, it looks great. But Can't even tell. Any other discussion on the motion? If not, we'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. And the motion passes. Agenda item number 19, diversion channel slope repair and sheet piling removal project. Once again, we have the change order, uh, the final change order, as well as the acknowledgement of the final pay request. Jason, any comments? A uh, little long on the cost on this one due to extra blanket and seating costs, uh, larger disturbed areas, and some, some found pipes in the project that we weren't aware of that we had to bring out, protect, do some different things. So um, stuff that was a little outside of our control uh, for some of it. Some of it was um, just bigger areas than what we had anticipated at bidding time. So project looks great. Questions for Jason? I just have one quick comment because this change order is, is negative per se, but total tonight I had three change orders that amounted to about a $36,000 savings for the city of Marshall. So I think our engineering department does a, a great job of getting this put together. Even though we had one that was, wasn't a Steve Meister type change order, mm -hmm. it was still um, overall it was a very positive evening for project completions. And I would make a motion to approve it because we have to. Second. Motion by Jim, seconded by Craig. Discussion? We also have to thank our contractors. And our contractors too, yes. Yep. Any other discussion? If not, we'll move to a vote. And we'll close the voting. And the motion passes. 
Agenda item number 20, consider the adoption of the ordinance amending the salaries and compensation of the mayor and council person. This was introduced at the last um, council meeting um, and as was described then, this is, um, and it was explained then, this is required by our charter, but it also is subject to state statute that says that any change needs to occur after the next um, city election. With that, Sharon, do you have anything you want to add? Just uh, as you alluded to, the statute states that no change shall take effect until after the next succeeding municipal election. So it is a checks and balance on any action that the council has taken tonight. Uh, people can voice their support or lack of support uh, at the uh, election in November. In your packet was included again the comparable salaries of the mayor and council with the mayor's salaries in comparison being six out of 12th, so right in the middle, <clears throat> and council members eight out of 12th in terms of um, uh, where you sit. And um, bringing it back to the founding fathers one more time, we didn't, uh, who stated uh, as they crafted some original language on elected official salary. You don't want a democracy where only the wealthy uh, can stand for elected positions. So elected official salary important to uh, maintaining uh, effective governance. So that's all I had, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Sharon. <clears throat> Craig? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just a comment or clarification, Sharon, on what you said about the voters have the option uh, at the next election. They don't get to say that we get the raise or not. They just get to say that those of us who are up at the election, if they disapprove, won't take part in the raise. There'll be a new person that replaces us. <laughs> Any other uh, input before? I just, I was going to make a motion to. Uh... Before you do that, I think Jim had something. I'm going to get my soapbox here because recently those who read the paper probably read that there was an opinion about, you know, should city council get a raise or not. And I would just like to express to the public for the $6,600 we get, the hours that we put in are tremendous. Um, there's stuff, and I'm gonna use an example of Craig and I went up to Wilmer to, to promote some stuff for the city of Marshall. I doubt Craig turned in a gas receipt. Nope. Craig and I are going to- Meals either, did we? Huh? We didn't turn in meals either. Nope. Meals. Uh, Craig, I, and I know I've talked to you, Russ, we're gonna go up there to try to, promote, try, to, try to get the state to promote information signs along 23. I doubt there'll be a receipt turned in for that. I was recently at the League of Minnesota Cities Convention. I did not turn in a receipt for my hotel room. So it kind of burns my ass when something like that goes in the paper because we give a lot of time for the money we get. And if you want to dollar it out, we're maybe making five, six bucks an hour, not including the receipts we didn't turn in. So I want to say to this council, we do a great job. And that, that opinion piece in the paper just got to me. And I just, I told you I was going to get my soapbox and that's one of them. And, if somebody else wants to do it, great. We don't get paid for what we do. We mostly volunteer. Yes, we get a salary, but you figure the hours and what we give, we're not making money. I think, Jim, it just goes to show you can tell a lot by people by the questions they ask. I'll just leave it at that. And I apologize for using vulgarity there, but that one just, that question got to me. Okay, any other input? <laughs> <laughs> it's no. the two ends that had it wrapped up. It's just, it's, you know, cheap shots. No, well, uh, I intend to make a motion to approve the 3% increase because I don't intend to take part in it. And I do want to have uh, what would be my replacement uh, starting uh, 2023 to uh, uh, be at least compensated for some of the work. and. Jim, uh, I think you're correct. I did sat down and kind of figured out, okay, how many hours versus that, and it's an okay pay. Um, you know, for what the hours, I'm, uh, I was satisfied with it. Uh, I totally enjoyed it, uh, and I'm hoping that somebody else comes in and uh, has just as much enjoyment on the spot. So with that, I would make a motion to approve. Okay, motion by John. Is there a second to that motion? I'll second that motion. I know I voted against in years past, but I'm going to second that motion this Seconded year. Seconded by Jim. Now, discussion on the motion. We'll make comments about 
the other part of your discussion later because it's not germane to the motion, but in terms of your service yeah. on council. I so. think it's partially in there, yeah. so yes. Um, Mr. Mayor, yes. I, I agree with Council Member Lazinski and Council Member DeKramer. Um, as I said, when we uh, voted on this a couple of weeks ago, um, you want to attract a diversity, which I don't really appreciate up here right now. Um, and nobody's going to get rich on this. Nobody should get rich on this. Um, but in order to get people to come away from children's baseball games, football games, hockey games, um, sacrifice a little bit, I think a salary, a token salary is okay. And like Sharon said, um, you don't want to be the top of the pack. You don't want to be the bottom of the pack. I think right in the middle, average, you know, nobody strives to be average. Average is run of the mill. You want to be superior. But in this case, I think average is good. Any other discussion on the motion? I think just to echo what, what other council members have said, just to in, remind the public, we get a minimal salary, but we don't get any per diems, like the county commissioners get a per diem. Uh, I believe the utilities commission members get paid. I don't know what they get paid. I don't know about school board people, but again, for the time that, that we as council members, yeah, we sit in a council meeting every two weeks, maybe for two hours, but how about the other meetings that we sit in for... 15 minutes or two and a half hours or city hall meetings that we met just about every week for a period of a year and a half. So, and again, I'm just tooting my own horn because the other council members, you know, had just as much time as I did. And so, yeah, if, if you, I think the $5 is being generous. I think we're probably more like in the 250 range, probably. <laughs> but again, we don't, we don't get per diems and we might get a free cookie if somebody bakes them every now and then. But. And remember, the, the minimum wage is still $15, yeah. and we are <laughs> yeah. well below minimum yeah. wage. Well, and I, th and I think the important thing about that is, is that I agree that the compensation is, is appreciated. I think it's a, it's a good representation. I know there's not one person here on the council that, that signed up to do this thinking about, well, I'm going to get that extra money. I think we would do it for free. But I do think it's important to have the compensation. And... Most of us would do it for free because we can. And I think for those that, I mean, I, I think it's important to, to have a respectful council salary for the people. And I agree with, with Doc Meister that we really need to invite the diversity. And if, if financial is one of the holdbacks, hopefully this helps. And one last thing, it, it's a way for people to give back. Right. I mean, be a part of your community. I mean, we have, mm -hmm. Craig, you say it at, at just about every meeting we have to appoint new people to commissions. We have hundreds of commissions and, yep. and these people come forward, they're giving of their time, yep. plain and simple. And that's a way of giving back to the community to be, to be involved, other than being in baseball or football or hockey or whatever the case would be. So exactly. yeah, giving back to the community. Any other discussion on the motion? If not, I'll bring us to a vote on the motion. And we'll close the voting. And the motion passes. Agenda number 21, Commission Board Liaison Reports. Uh, the Southwest Regional Development Commission did have their annual meeting uh, since we last met. John DeKramer was also in attendance there. Um, and it was hosted in Marshall. So it was um, a nice to see that, and it was a very good meeting. Um, with that, Greg. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Merit Center met. I was in Texas, so I was not able to attend. Steve. EDA met. I was uh, unable to attend because of work obligations. I'll defer that to Council Member to Kramer. John? Yeah, I'll say EDA did meet. Uh, we had uh, uh, elections for the various board commissions, and uh, um, then we also have uh, did a loan extension to uh, United Community Action uh, on their housing because uh, they had some delays in getting materials or whatever, so we just did a a short uh, extension on their loans. Uh, utilities did uh, also meet, and uh, just a couple of uh, little highlights out of there. Uh, you know, we've had discussions in the past uh, couple of meetings about, uh, you know, potential of uh, some uh, rotating blackouts or whatever. Well, what uh, uh, they do run a uh, uh, their turbine, which is located next to the utility building. And uh, that's kind of a, a just a test. They get a call saying, turn it on, get it going. You got so many minutes to bring it up uh, to speed. 
and we want X amount of power out of it. Uh, well, uh, they got it going. They ran for an hour and 22 minutes. Uh, they had requested uh, uh, 15,500 uh, 15, kilowatt hours, and they ended up uh, producing uh, over uh, 20,000 uh, kilowatt hours. So uh, shows that the generator's in good shape. It's able to help out and uh, get things going. Kind of on the negative side, uh, you know, with uh, everyone else, they're having issues with uh, supplies, primarily copper uh, wiring. Uh, they're in good shape for the next construction year, but uh, uh, just really anticipating, um, you know, I should say through 2022 and into 2023, but anticipating uh, some uh, things need to start moving through for 2023, uh, things like uh, transformers, which may be an issue on what we just talked about in the annexation with the, uh, the solar farm going in. Uh, some of those components are out to uh, 60 weeks. So uh, very long term, uh, their supplies are limited and uh, it's making it difficult keeping up on things. Uh, fortunately, we're in good shape for, like I said, for the construction year, they're really planning for uh, end of 2023 and into 2024. So trying to keep a jump on it. Um, and then last thing, uh, I talk about uh, Merit Center in August. There will be a um, Southwest Minnesota uh, AWWA, which is a water association. Uh, there'll be a school here in Marshall on the 24th, and uh, since the uh, city is hosting that, uh, the MMU is hosting that, uh, they're having tours, they're showing, uh, doing talks on various subjects and uh, doing quite a bit. But that's going to bring in another crew of people into uh, the city for uh, the Merit Center and staying in town and everything else. So. I'm actually giving a welcome at that. Hopefully it's not controversial. Yeah, that's right. You are. Yeah. All of you are 35 seconds. Or so. <laughs> Anything else, John? That's it. Russ? John, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear WWA doesn't stand for World Wide Wrestling or so. A -W -W -A. A -W -W -A. whatever it is. Yeah. So, yeah. The only thing I had was uh, CVB, and, and uh, we continue to receive community support requests. Uh, I just want to make note of one. We received a request from Maha for their various tournaments throughout the year. Um, they will, during the course of the year, they will be bringing in or having 67 teams for the tournaments. 58 of those teams will be from out of town. So uh, the big date, uh, if you haven't heard, Prairie Jam is the concert that's going to be held out at SMSU. Uh, that's on September 29th, uh, the Thursday night of homecoming week. And they've signed a country western star that I think Jim has seen a couple of times Ty, Tyler Farr, who will be the main event. So that's all I have. Okay. Jim? I have nothing. We'll move then to um, council member individual items. Do you have anything? I have a couple. Um, we've received emails recently about pickleball courts, yeah. like we all have. And I talked to Preston, and Preston has done stuff for the pickleball courts. You know, he just recently bought a um, wind fencing form in the last couple of weeks, he put the lines on the court. So he's been working with them. And the suggestion I would make to the pickleball community is city budgets are tight. And I'm gonna use the archery range that was done here in Marshall as a good example. They brought their own money in and then the city helped facilitate that. Press and I visited about that today that um, there, there is opportunities out there for spots for pickleball. But if, if I would encourage that committee to go out and raise some donations and come visit with us about what your solutions are and work like the archery club did on pickleball court and we can work together, but just sending an email asking us for courts probably isn't gonna happen in our budget real soon because as Jason will tell you, we have more pressing issues right now when we do have spots for them to use play pickleball, if they want their own designated courts, work on it. So I, I, let me just jump in here sure. and Sharon, you may want to reference this too. We've also had a discussion on this, and I know our community services staff is looking at indoor um, opportunities and using existing facilities. And can, are they going to be available? Can they be striped? That type of thing. So, Perfect. The other thing, and this is more for an update for next city council meeting, um, 
enterprise. I don't know how well that's worked out or if it's worked out at all. I just guess I would like to have an update. I know you hear all the time, you can't get pickups, we can't get this, we can't get this. The type of pickups the city buys, you can get. I ordered one six weeks ago and I have it, I'm driving it. A work truck is, I think MMU got their vehicles. Some of them, yeah. So I, I would like to have an update on Enterprise and what the reason is, is that they didn't go through and replace, because we have basic, you know, Jason, the trucks you guys spec are very basic. So I, I, I should, it was six to eight weeks and I had my order, but I'm driving it now. So it's not like this year long process. So I'd like to have an update from Enterprise. Why I would, I would say they dropped the ball this year on it. And, and it's just to have an update next in two weeks about what, are the, what is the solution to that or is there a solution? That's all I had on there. I have nothing. John? I have nothing. Craig? Um, Just a real quick thank you to the Downtown Business Association folks for their um, time that they've spent working with us, kind of, I guess I'd call it a, an engineering and a PINT add-on. <coughs> they've uh, been pretty vocal, but they've come up with good ideas and there's nobody that's come to those meetings that's afraid to tell us what they think and why, and I think that's really appreciated. Um, <clears throat> so with that, as we move forward, I, I'm pretty confident that uh, we're going to get the bones of at least on 3rd Street and that whole area that's going to pay pretty well forward for the community for, for a good amount of time. So I want to throw that pitch out there just to... You know, I think there's some people that feel like maybe we don't hear what they're saying, and I think it's important that they that we do hear what they're saying. We may not always be able to give them everything they want, but we should certainly be able to tell them why and why not. So I just appreciate that. Okay. Steve? Just a couple of safety issues. Today, before I came to the meeting, I went bicycling, and I almost got hit by two different semis for the same reason. They both cut me off making right-hand turns, and I just wanted people to realize that pedestrians... Cyclists, please pay attention. They have rights. If a pedestrian looks like they're going to cross the road, stop and let them cross the road. If you're on a bike um, and you see a cyclist, they are a vehicle. They are the same vehicle as a car. It doesn't matter that you are going to turn and you're bigger and they're moving slower. Please give them due responsibility. Now, that being said, cyclists, we see cyclists all the time not following the rules. It's a two-way street. We need to follow the rules as well. So that's it. Very good. Thank you, Steve. Um, I would just uh, add just two things here. One is a reminder that uh, our first meeting in August will be on Monday evening, August 8th. And, of course, that's because there's a special election as well as a primary election. will be on Tuesday, August 9th, so we can't meet that evening. So we next meet on Monday, August 8th. And also the filing period for the general election for city council seats. And, of course, there's uh, three open seats, one in each of the three wards in the city of Marshall. That opens August 2nd and goes to the 16th. Stephen, if um, uh, individuals have questions, they come to your office, and it's a um, pretty straightforward uh, process to file for election. Correct. Uh, you just have to file this affidavit of candidacy that I've got up here and then pay me $5. And if you want me to, I will take a picture with you that you can post. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, very good. So August 2nd to August 16th is the open period for filings for open council positions in wards one, two, and three. If Schaefer and I can do it, anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> With, with that, let's move then to uh, agenda item number 23. This would be staff reports. Sharon Hansen, city administrator. Um, I believe in my admin update via email, I indicated the number of city attorney RFPs, so we're collating the data. And uh, we'll have future discussion with the mayor on potential review and how we want to bring it forward. We do have a goal of bringing it back to council for October 1st, we did receive one bid for indoor recreation, YMCA feasibility, which I think is really, really important because we do get requests from various organizations. The email regarding pickleball is just one example of um, 
people's wants and needs. You know, it's, we got to kind of distinguish between the two. And then um, just the future of the YMCA. I did attend their strategic planning session last Wednesday evening, and uh, they will participate in the cost of the study. And I'm hoping to connect with some other groups as well uh, in terms of assisting with the, with the cost. And that will come back to council here, uh, hopefully, if not the next meeting, the meeting after that. So uh, final thing, staff has discussed enterprise um, supply. Issues have been uh, a challenge for enterprise and we have done some research into to Council Member Lazinski's um, points as well. And uh, EJ has indicated that we would definitely come back to the next meeting and give an update on that. So that's all I had, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Jason. Thank you, Mayor. Um, we've talked a lot about council time tonight, so I would just say that we do appreciate your time on the committee level. I know, especially in the PIT committee, we've asked a lot of you this year, and we do appreciate it. I noticed that Councilman Labatt did kind of look at me when he said cookies, so I'll have to try to remember to bake cookies yeah. <laughs> the next wow. time. Oh, <laughs> All right. Um, I, I said I'd have a quick update on line and thirds. So we can just start with that. You know, uh, Jesse and I did meet with MnDOT and Bolton and Mink traffic engineers after, I think it was last week, after having the discussion with the DBA. Um, you are correct in saying that you know, I think there was general buy-in from that group on the layout as we were presenting it, the one way down third, the widths, the typical what we're showing. Um, but there was apprehension with removal of the signal, uh, specifically regarding they wanted people to be able to cross Main Street on each side of third. They did not like taking the signal out and consolidating the crossing to one location with a pedestrian signal. Um, so we did meet with um, the MnDOT folks and, you know, I do believe that MnDOT's going to be open to that, open to leaving the signal in place, open to just taking the signal heads out that face third and, and leaving it in place and maybe making some other minor modifications. But I think that was a real positive and I hope that when we go back to the DBA we can um, show that compromise and, and hopefully get some buy-in and maybe even a letter of support from them would be nice. But um, our next step then would be to meet with PIT again, which we plan to do. I think it got scheduled for Monday the 8th, but it is. Yeah, I think at 11 a.m., 11 yeah. to 1230. So I think that we're hopefully we'll have already met with the DBA on August 3rd. We'll go to committee, talk this through. I'll probably want to start talking assessments and streetscaping as well. Um, so we'll have a lot to talk about, but we're, we're making progress. It is a slog you know, when you start to deal with these public input and big changes. It just takes time. Yep. And a lot of staff hours and cost and but we're, we're getting there um, park project looks good all the concrete is in I believe everything's backfilled now with black dirt it's starting to look nice next step is to um, pull the silt fence and cut some grass um, get it seeded and, and mulched we're hoping maybe the second <coughs> week of August we can get it seeded and mulched we want to wait long enough that it's not a desert that's kind of part of the issue and seed is expensive right now so um, we'll see there Halber Road looks good all the utilities are done gravels down and compacted now it'll probably sit for a while while we wait for concrete so that's a it's a good thing I think I think that project's been going well too they've all had temporary access the business is out there and I haven't heard complaints so uh, West Lyon by block 11 kind of went in quick the utilities are done gravel is there once again waiting for all the concrete I know they started today with some sidewalk and curb and gutter and we'll we'll see a little bit more of that this week with um, probably finishing concrete next week <clears throat> Uh, South First Street, water and sewer is done from George to, to DeShepper. Water services are done on one block up to George to Maple. I think they've still got services to go from Maple to DeShepper. More underground work to happen likely on Greeley next week. So we'll just see that continue. Um, it's going well so far. Mill and overlays, the streets are milled. We expect paving to begin on Thursday. Uh, our RFB project, we're still unsure of when Dunnick intends to start. Uh, what we do know is that we need the medians done before school starts, and we've expressed that to them. So we'll, we'll expect that the medians are installed before September 2nd. 
uh, the signage and the RRFBs themselves and the advanced speed signs, likely not until this fall. I think they are out until mid-October on delay. So we'll work with Dunnick on that, but we really want to get the medians in place. There shouldn't be a reason to delay that, and we don't want to be doing construction during school traffic. I think that's all I've got for project updates. Okay, any questions for Jason? Dennis? Thank you, Mayor and Council. A few updates, mostly real estate issues. Um, work, continue to work with Helena to finish that project. I know Council Member Lozinski, you're anxious for some work there. We'll break it off, Council. <laughs> yeah. um, Retire. There was recently, what, a, a request for some a utility locates. I think there's going to be some more soil borings, some more testing done out there. We're working with Helena to come up with a plan as to take down the or the Quonset before it falls down on itself. But there's ongoing discussions regarding the Helena property. Parkway addition, this is EDA stuff. Um, recall Habitat for Humanity moved that large house out there. That's all been moved. They also closed on the sale of the lot right next to it. So that will be the next um, Habitat project. And there's also one outstanding purchase agreement that's ready to close. The buyer just has to schedule a time to meet with meet with myself, make the final payment. The deed is all ready to go. So there's one more lot out in Parkway Edition that's been sold, um, waiting to close on the National Guard out in that, um, Commerce Park. The, the, all the documents are signed. They just have to come up with $46 to record the deed. So there's a requisition in at the state level to get the recording. <laughs> Recording fee. Yeah. Yeah. Budget here. yeah, that's right. Yeah. $10 billion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then also we're waiting for the signed purchase agreement back from the Jim Brock Trucking, who buying some Sansegard property, the new trucking company for runnings. Again, that one's pretty much ready to go. We're just waiting for them to sign the terms of the purchase agreement. And I think everything else has been addressed. EDA, the UCAP loan will have to put together an extension agreement extending out the terms of that loan. Um, annexation has been approved tonight. I'll have to work with Fairview Township to schedule our public hearing to, to discuss that matter. And then you'll notice in the um, agenda early on tonight, in the consent agenda, we had to have another resolution on the CDI plat. Between the preliminary plat and the final plat, they changed the legal description on us. Mm -hmm. so, we just had to approve the description in your resolution has to match up with the description on the plat. And that's coming from the recorder's office. So that has been done. That'll be recorded yet this week. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Dennis. <clears throat> the remaining items on the agenda for information, um, the um, meeting minutes from the library and the public housing commission and the planning commission the report on our cash and investments our listing of building permits and listing of upcoming meetings is there any questions about any of those items no questions but i just have one other thing you have something more to say go ahead on behalf of myself jesse and maybe the rest of the council good luck to you thank you for your service to the city of marshall thank you. mr mayor yeah i also wanted to do the same thing jesse is uh, a <clears throat> current chair of the PINT committee. I just want to thank you for all the contributions, the hard work you did. I know that you and Jason make a, a really awesome team. Um, sad to see you go. Wish you all the best up there. And, and uh, But I just want you to know all those efforts that you put into all the maps and the diagrams and all that extra charting and, and work that you guys have done is, is outstanding and really appreciate the way you guys have brought projects forward as a team. Um, you're going to be hard to replace. Obviously, I'm sure somehow, somewhere we'll find somebody. But uh, good luck and thanks again. I really appreciate all that you've done for us. And, then, and I would just uh, echo what the others have said. Thank you for your service. Your work here will be a lasting imprint. Yep. So as you come back and visit the community, you'll look at projects that you worked on and helped design that have improved our community. Maybe so we should you. get some little Jesse stickers that go, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Is there anything I, else to come forward? I was just going to say, yeah, you really don't want to move up there up north, do you? I mean, it's cold and it's snowy. And I mean, you're down south here. It's such nice weather. Come on. You really don't. Mosquitoes are like three. Yeah, mosquitoes are nasty. Up bugs there. are horrible. Deer flies. Yeah, it's not that good. Ticks. 
I'll make a motion to adjourn the meeting. So Dr. Yeah. Meister has an appointment. Well, it's, it's actually got canceled because no. well, oh. talk longer. I still make a motion to adjourn the meeting. Second. Tim, seconded by Craig to adjourn discussion. If not, we'll move to a vote. I'll close the voting. And the motion does pass. We are adjourned.